Hello, everyone. Welcome to the April 2021 edition of the Utah Amateur Radio Club online meeting. We have with us the usual, including Morris. You're one of the usual. Say something, Morris. Something, Morris. All right. We have with us today also Randy Colway, WI7P, who will be giving our feature presentation on digital modes of various sorts. So stay tuned for that, especially if you are in a antenna compromised area and just can't get out or hear very well. But anyway, we have a few things of, to discuss in the way of business. Morris, tell us about the classes that you have underway and will have underway. Okay, well, let me let me, let me put that further down the list and mention some of the other things that are of general interest to the uh, membership. And starting with field day, which is coming up in another couple of months, uh, and the steak fry, which is about two and a half weeks after that, three weeks after that, um, in the schedule currently, uh, we are watching very carefully what uh, the medical professionals' uh, recommendations are. And if at all possible, we will hold those events, but we will not hold them if uh, there is a, uh, any potential of significant contamination, if you will, uh, infection of uh, the people that attend. So uh, that is going to be a decision made uh, especially by those medical professionals at their recommendations. So we will let you know as we know is basically what that amounts to. So uh, keep in touch on our web page. Uh, we will post a notice there as soon as a positive decision one way or the other has been made. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gordon and myself, Gordon, uh, K seven H F A O oh boy. Anyway, Gordon and I are putting together a presentation uh, about Solar Cycle nineteen. Uh, you say, what is Solar Cycle nineteen? Uh, the Solar Cycle that we are just beginning is Solar Cycle twenty five, which makes the one that just ended Solar Cycle twenty four. Solar Cycle twenty four was one of the worst, or perhaps the worst, solar cycle. Uh, in recorded history. So we're hoping that solar cycle 25 will be significantly better. But the best solar cycle uh, in terms of radio communications ever was solar cycle 19, which was from 1954 to 1964. So if you were licensed as a ham in that period of time, 1954 to 1964, we would appreciate it if you would get in contact with us so that we can talk to you and perhaps make a short recording of what you remember from that period of time uh, in Hamdom, if you will. And also, I want to remind everybody that uh, each December, we will be making an award of the Member of the Year and the member of the year is that member of UARC that has best re represented uh, the intentions of ham radio as defined by uh, the FCC in their first paragraph of what uh, ham radio is all about, part 97. But anybody that you think is just a truly outstanding member and uh, sort of the cream of the cream of the crop, uh, please write up. Uh, at this point, you can just write up a couple of sentences and uh, preferably send it to me, but any member of the board would be okay. Uh, and we will uh, consider them and uh, probably get back to you and ask for more detailed information. And as Clint mentioned, uh, we have classes. Classes are going to start next Monday, the technician class. That will be 
on April 12th, and the general class will start on April 14th. Both classes run for nine weeks. They will be online, and uh, you will have to register with me uh, before the classes start so that I can put you on the list of people to be notified so that you can get the invitation to attend the class. Uh, all of the classes are recorded, so if you miss one or are, are unable to join right at the beginning of a class or have to leave before the class is over, you'll be able to go, uh, as soon as I get it posted on YouTube, you'll be able to go to that class and uh, review it. So uh, the classes are, again, a technician class starts at 7 p.m. till 9 p.m. on Monday the 12th. The general license class starts on Wednesday the 14th at 7 p.m. till 9 p.m. and also runs for nine weeks. Please send me an email if you plan on attending. Otherwise, you won't get the opportunity. And you can send it to me at my call sign, ad7sr at arrl dot net. That's ad7sr at arrl dot net. Back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Morris. Let's see. One thing I should remind people: they, if you're a member of the AWRL, I'll try to keep the glare off it. Probably got. An envelope that looked kind of like that. That's the AWRL section manager ballot. I would encourage you to vote for the person of your choice and return them. So, also, uh, remind people that uh, there's a project coming up. Uh, certainly in May, we'll give details as to when exactly, when we know them. But as you may know, UARC has for available for free for any of its members with general class or higher licenses, a remote HF station that uses the, um, oh, drawing a blank on the software, the uh, uh, RC Forbes software that you can run on a phone or a, or a Windows machine, uh, Android phone or Windows. And it gives you access to, to two, I'll, I'll, I'll wager you, two, HF stations, one near Lemington and the other one at the cabin of Glen, WA7X near Fairview. And as you probably know, if you've been watching, we have an ongoing project of upgrading the Lemington station. We are putting in a beam atop the existing AT&T Long Lines Tower. The top of the beam will be just about 80 some odd feet up when we get done. It'll be a log periodic, so it'll be capable of covering 20 through 10 meters. And that is expected to take a couple weekends, and we're shooting for some time in early to mid-May or maybe early June as over several weekends to complete that particular section of that project, which has been going on for a while. We already have the beam and the rotator so and various other sundry things, so we're well underway. And I think that's about it, Morris. Anything else? Oh, aside from, if you willing to, if you want to take an exam, remember to go to the hamstudy.org/slash. What is it? Sessions? Is that right? Go to hamstudy.org. If you if you've been studying for your exam, which I'm sure you have because you've been stuck at home like a lot of us, and are itching to take an exam, go there. There's some in-person exams in the Utah area, and you can also take them online if you aren't willing to venture out just yet. Uh, I would encourage you to do that if you are ready to upgrade or get your license in the first place or know someone who is. Let's see. I will uh, say acknowledge some of the uh, people that have joined us on the chat. If you have a question, uh, make sure you use the YouTube chat function. I see hello from... Uh, Carl C and 7 PLI from Highland, and also John Gardner from Moab. Welcome everyone and everyone else who's watching. I think we've gotten the business out of the way. So Randy, get yourself unmuted and uh, awoken and everything else. 
and uh, I will allow you to introduce yourself because you probably know us. You know yourself better than any of us. So take it away. All right. Well, my name's Randy. I've been a ham for a while, <laughs> many years it seems now. Started out when there was uh, bulletin boards and TNCs and uh, thought that's just what I was going to do. Then I finally got a house and uh, found out I could put antennas up and immediately started working uh, the high orbiting amateur satellites and uh, did that for a lot of years. I'm still doing satellites, but uh, they're a whole lot smaller than they used to be. Uh, I finally the house that I moved to last, I did put up a tower, so I've had an evolution of antennas that I'll go through and show you some of the evolution there. And uh, the one thought that came to my mind is uh, if you start simple, uh, you might get hooked and want to upgrade, and that certainly has been the case for me over time. Anyway, so uh, I'll uh, start the presentation. Uh, trying to uh, give you some ideas of how I use the digital molds and how successful I've been. And if there's time at the end of where I'm headed in the future, I've got one major project coming up that I'll talk about in, in the end. So let's see if I can go down here, share my screen. Okay, that slideshow should be there. Uh, am I doing okay, Clinton, right now? Looks good so far. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about some of these digital modes I've used over uh, in the past and uh, still using them. In fact, uh, one of them's running in a computer behind my laptop here right now. Um, so sort of will give you a chat tour with a lot of photos through this. So. I'll talk about why I used digital modes of mine. You might want to uh, show you what I, how my chats evolved in hardware and software. I'll do a couple demos and talk about the future. So why work digital? Well, with the uh, low and the solar cycle, I decided I was gonna start chasing awards. <laughs> and uh, all of this is since FT8 came out. And that's what, uh, other than JT65 for moon bounce between 13, 2000, 13 to 2015, uh, most of all of this has come on the HF bands. So it was, because uh, it's just sort of my summaries here. There's still a few bands that uh, which would open up more, the six meters, 15 meters, I'm getting a bit more on 10 meters. And I hope to be back on moon bounce on two meters at some point. Uh, DXCC, I got my uh, digital certificate back in July 3rd of 2018. I don't know if it was just probably over a, a year where I had it. I already had a, a good start on two meters, but uh, I was able to rework most of those countries over again. So as I was saying, I still have lots to do on 160 and 80 and 15 meters. Uh, every once in a while I get on and uh, get two or three new countries. Uh, not doing much on 12 and 10 meters right now. And the two meter satellites sort of waiting for me to finish my current chat projects and uh, redo my sequencing. Uh, as far as the countries, this might be hard to leave, read for a bunch of you, but I have a spreadsheet that I have the country and what bands I worked it on. Uh, that first red one, uh, Albania, I only worked it on two meter EME and only have a QSL verification. Uh, the one down in yellow, Leningrad, I have worked on 20 meters, but he wasn't on Logbook of the World. Uh, most of the others that are black have been confirmed on Logbook of the World. And the ones in blue or green are waiting to be submitted for DSCC credit. Uh, the other one that seems going to take a while is the Fred Fish Memorial Award. There's sort of an equivalent to this award that was they came up with on satellite, which I was one of the first to get it, although I've made it a project to do it. I just didn't 
bother to check to see the official list of grids. So uh, my initial criteria, I was going to work a satellite in every grid that you could drive to in the 48 states. Uh, if you looked at this FF or Fred Fish Memorial Award map, in that outline, peak outline, uh, you notice that goes out to some islands and uh, there's one at the mouth of the Mississippi that you have to drive to. So I had a lot more in mind because if uh, they fell on the border of Canada, I, I got the grid squares on both sides. So right now I'm up to 181 of the grids uh, for VCC on six meters. I have a lot more and have that century award on satellite. As you can see at one time, I was really busy. I had 859 grids. Uh, I had worked and I was ahead of the VUC satellite for a long time, but uh, I cut back and while I was cut back, uh, some Russian sailor captain uh, started putting grids all over the oceans. <laughs> and people got over a thousand grids from him. So I'm, I'm way behind the leaders now. I uh, got five band worked all states, uh, still haven't got all the 50 states on six meters and two meters uh, to the meter ones. A lot of them are on wind bounce. I've got worked all zones, which is probably harder than working uh, 100 countries for DFCC. I got it on 20 meters, all digital. And it looks like I had, it was the number 15 for the 20 meter work call zone award that was issued. Uh, I also do the CT awards. Uh, I've got a certificate for working a thousand counties on HF and over a thousand prefixes, uh, call sign prefixes on HF. So uh, also in 2018 in the AWRL grid chase, I did a lot of that and I felt I did pretty well. Uh, <laughs> to be on the top of that list, you had to be on, it seems like all the time. But in that, if you don't remember, every month you went and tried to work grids and then the ne next month you could go try to work those grids over again. And then it sort of uh, totaled up over the year. Uh, I was having so much fun on that. I continued and uh, the grid square shown in red are the ones that I've got confirmed on Logbook of the World on HF. Uh, the blue ones I've worked to have QSL cards for some of them. There's the ones I have for North America on HF. Uh, if I had the Fred Fish Award, I'd have all that uh, Fred Fish filled out. So since I also include those in this FH, FH uh, category. Uh, and one more is I haven't quite got worked all Japan grids yet, but I'm getting close. And there's sort of a, a map of all the grids I've worked uh, in, in the world, a uh, combination of HF. And I think there's probably two or three, two, two meter ones thrown in there. So how did my shack hardware evolve at my current house? Well, I went big right at the start. I, I went with a four bay of uh, two meter Yag, cross Yaggies for moon bounce and was running JT65. Uh, then uh, did a little bit of satellite, add some eight meter antennas. I had one, one of them from an AMSAT uh, uh, symposium meeting and had another matching one. So I just put them up there. We didn't need the rotator to rotate around, but I could work the satellite and linear transponders on there. Uh, when I started, the vertical tower wasn't there, but you can get an idea of my offset center uh, fed dipoles. One starts down here in the southwest corner of my lot. Another one starts up here. Uh, there's the center feed for the lower one, the center feed for the upper one. I'm still using these antennas. The lower one I'm using on to get onto the beehive net usually. Uh, also, if I do a live demo of uh, FT8 or FT4, I'll be using that lower antenna. 
uh, to continue up to the house. There was the one feed here up in the other. You can see the bigger feed for the higher power antenna. And then they sort of split. You can barely see the one going over the top of my house. The other one heads to the other south corner of my property. Uh, one over the house comes up and is guided to the street in the front. Then the other one goes to the corner, then still had some wire to deal with. So I just ran it north along the fence. Uh, then I decided to add a rotatable dipole, upgraded the eight beater antennas with some circular polarized small cross or polarized gadgies. I put land fear preamps in the back of them to sort of counterbalance them. I got a step crank IR and I was also using that on some of the HF bands. Uh, mainly I use it on 60 meters every once in a while. If I get the urge to work that band, I'll go put it up and uh, see what I can work on there. Uh, so once I got a tower, I really didn't need that rotatable dipole anymore. So I did one of the local hams and helped me a lot. So I gave it to him and it's up on his house about three or four blocks from my house right now. And he's still using it. So there's a tower. Some of you art members uh, helped me with it uh, to get it uh, recabled and uh, it's up. So the rotatable dipole was still up there waiting for a, a beam to put on top of that. So I got a, an alpha speed rotor for it, a uh, green hair and controller. I got a tilt plate to help me lower the counter or the tower and the antenna in my backyard since I didn't have much room there. Uh, there's a picture of the step IR can't, uh, antenna that I got to replace the uh, rotatable dipole. I was having so much fun with that rotatable dipole. I figured, well, what what can I put up that might be uh, better on some more bands? And so I bought it with the 34 loop uh, dipole option and added the six meter passive element and sort of very faint there by the rotor. Also, it was sagging. So uh, last time I had it down, I uh, sort of tied up the two loose ends. So this, uh, the bottom pictures are what it uh, currently is. And every once in a while, I will get on the locals. So I put a tri-band on two meters, 220 and 440 up there on the very top. Uh, also, I added, since the rotatable dipole disappeared, I added a 16 element uh, 1.2 gig antenna uh, I was kind of too late doing it. I was going to use an AL-92, but uh, that satellite hasn't been working too well lately. And when you start doing all those antennas, uh, you find out you should have got a bigger box, the entry box to begin with. So uh, <laughs> no, it's not the best, uh, but at least it's not coming in on the second uh, floor window, as was being talked about later. Uh, uses Morgan and Polyphaser and one other brand of uh, of lightning protectors. So for shack hardware or the radials that I used when I was doing the additional moon bounce, uh, Earth Moon Earth, uh, I was using uh, my real old FT seven thirty six into some power amplifiers. Uh, for it doesn't have HF on it. Uh, this one I did added the 220 module and the 1.2 good modules in it. Uh, another thing I was using uh, for doing EME was the FunCube Dongle Pro, which is an SDR you can get out of England. I used two of them and had two laptops running uh, the software you would use for JT65, the WSJT software. Uh, so whichever is better on horizontal or vertical or combining the two, uh, I used to complete my uh, Moonbox uh, USLs. Uh, currently, I'm using the Kenwood TS-2000 uh, for HF on the satellites, although it's had a bug 
ever since it was created that two of my most popular FM satellites I'd like to work. It has a birdie right in the middle of them and uh, you can't work the whole pass. Uh, you sort of have to wait until uh, the Doppler shifts the receive signal away from it. Uh, for interfacing, I'm using a Rig Blaster Advantage. I've tried a lot of others, but this seems to be working pretty good for me now. Uh, it has one USB connection to your computer. Uh, does the RS-232 connection to the uh, radio and allows me to also plug a mic into the front and use it for logging into the Beehive net as well as doing the digital. Uh, that table that you used, I have a number four uh, was long, so I cut out half and made me two different cables. I used one half that they put on and one half on the other. Uh, one is just three wires. The other one has some jumpers there for the hardware control for the TS-2000. And I also uh, have a little setup and I'm gonna show how, if you don't have a ham license and you wanna look at uh, uh, the digital modes, you can use the Northern Utah Web SDR that I know that's been talked about. So I added a little uh, USB uh, sound card. I come out of a, uh, PC, the audio out and feed it into the sound card. I think I've ever even been able to uh, just do a loop from the audio out into the microphone and have what I'm going to show you. Uh, you can do work. Uh, more details on, on this little USB sound card hub. I liked one so much I got another one uh, to put on another radio. Uh, I had a stand up workstation and I had a TV I shared. And so what I do is run the web SDR over there, sort of uh, gives me a glance of where it's thinking the people are uh, doing the FT8, and it's especially handy on fat sounds. So I know somebody doesn't jump on top of where I'm calling and gives me, so I can have the ability to change. Um, a little di uh, picture of the Windows 10 computer I got uh, refurbished. Uh, I'm doing FT8 on six meters. As I said, I had that crank IR there uh, that I can uh, set it up for six meters. I'm using an FT857 since the TS2000 is set up on that band. And that's worked. And I also got the FT857. At one point, I was using two of that, those to rover on the satellites. Uh, for tracking, I have an old G5500 I have for a long time. I have a little LVB tractor bots. There's another party that, or a company that is selling the same thing now under another name. And I had a spare IP camera, so I put it up on the roof where I can watch my antennas turn and just make sure my cables aren't getting hung up. Uh, for Shack uh, software, uh, WSJT, you can get from this location. Uh, if you want to listen to the web SDR, it will work with it. Uh, I found out yesterday, the day before, that it, it doesn't decode reliably. I'm not sure if it's the internet or, or what's going on. Uh, it seems in the past when I've run it, it's good. So you can go download the package there for Windows or Linux. Uh, it's fairly easy to set up. Uh, I pretty much use the defaults as shown here. Once you download that executable, uh, you can do a default location. But in my case, I like to put it, I, I keep all the versions there for a while because sometimes I go back to them. And I just use the default on where uh, put in the menu. So that shows when it started running and the setup is done. So it doesn't take too much work to do that. As far as the web SDR side, you just need a web browser. Uh, here I've logged into there and turned into uh, the 20 meter CW band, found the FT8 little tab and uh, zoomed way in. So I could see the signals that are, are going into there. Uh, Getting uh, WSJT apps that I downloaded to go, I can go to your Windows thing, select it. When an icon shows up in the lower menu or taskbar, I'd like to pin it to the taskbar to bring it up in the future. 
as far as setting it up to use with the web SDR, uh, you do the file settings uh, under my call. I put that in, I put the grid in for the grid square up there where the web SDR antennas are. I do a slash seven to my call so I know if I enable it to uh, spotlight what it's receiving up there, which I've done at times, it's different than my home call. Uh, for uh, radio, there's no radio because I'm not going to transmit. Can't transmit up there in reverse. Uh, there, I had the microphone from that USB sound card for output. It really doesn't matter since I'm not going to transmit. Uh, some case you need to go add frequencies. Uh, show you what I, I did the other day uh, in testing things out. And if you want to do Fox Hound, typically for that, I just leave it in the normal mode so I can uh, see everybody uh, that's in the FTA passband. And, uh, and also sometimes I can find using that SDR where the Fox Hound is, is hanging out at because usually it's on a different uh, frequency than your normal default FT8 is. Uh, so one to, uh, I was on JT65, I went up and clicked on FT8 to set it to FT8 and didn't have anything decoding. Uh, I was seeing stuff in the waterfall. So my first thing I did is I went to this site and found out that my clock uh, on that computer was two and a half seconds ahead. On my ones that I normally run it, I have another uh, program running that uh, they suggest to keep your time accurate all the time. So this told me I was off, it fixed it. I went there again and uh, I found out that I'm on right now. And another handy thing on the side, if you click to the bottom, you can click on that UTC. And now you have a nice big UTC clock uh, you can uh, use in your shack. And as I said, sometimes it decodes, sometimes it doesn't. Later in the day on 20 meters, it was decoding calls off the web SDR. Uh, here's the waterfall. <laughs> so you can see lots of signals up there, even when it doesn't decode, uh, uh, you can see this. And it helps me to find gaps in it where I might want to uh, set my transmitter at. Another program I use is JT Alert. Uh, it will give me some audio alerts uh, when a uh, new band or grid or country or something uh, shows up and highlights it in color. It also does logging and spotting. Uh, WSJT ats will log, but JT alert also logs and I don't do anything to any particular logging program. I just log to standard ADA file. Then I have some software that I use for picking out the new contacts from that and uploading it to Logbook of the World and then getting back to Logbook of the World and updating my ADA files to, uh, for things that I've got uh, QSLs from on Logbook of the uh, World. Uh, I won't go into a whole lot of detail here, but there's sort of three files you download, the, the main JT alert. There's sound files that go with it for announcing your new grids and that. And then there's a database of uh, call signs. Uh, choose your own version, male, female, British, English. There's some others there. Install instructions is pretty easy. Just to download it. You run the setup. Uh, and you run each of the other two uh, sound and database files to install those. And at the bottom, you can see the three executables that I had downloaded. Uh, another program I was going to demonstrate tonight, if the analog satellite was up, but uh, it was up there during the first of the meeting. And uh, I use an SDR console that shows the past band using one of those FunCube uh, USB SDRs that I showed earlier. And then I can see when the beacon comes up and see who's all in the past band, since you have multiple sideband signals going on. 
uh, let's find out if satellites are up. Uh, this is one of the programs I use, uh, and it shows the, the meeting time that uh, W2F was going to show up. And down the bottom is sort of the frequency plan for there's a whole series of those that's W satellites. Uh, to find out if they're there, you can go to amsat.org. And if you look, it did say that uh, people are reporting that they were up and working uh, for a demo now. I did a bunch of static stuff. The first thing I usually do is go to this website and see if there's any DS up. Uh, if you looked at the bottom, Mozambique uh, C92RU says that they were going to be on on FT8 uh, for positions. Uh, so that was a country I hadn't had and wanted to work. So the next place I went was to this DX heat site. Uh, it showed the band activity over in Europe, which looks like there was in Asia was having fun. Uh, but looking down the list, I wasn't seeing that uh, C92 anywhere. Uh, so what I did in the search box, uh, you can enter C92. I changed the band activity to North America. It wasn't too hot. There are not too many people were on. Uh, and then the activity was going up a little bit. Uh, so once I entered that call sign, it did a search, gave me some preliminary information. And then when I scrolled down a little more, it showed some spots for them, and it showed that uh, down at the bottom on FT8, they were on 10 meds, and also they were on 17 meters on 18.096 uh, earlier. Uh, so I decided to uh, uh, try out uh, all bands and see what was happening on FT8 and then looking down there to see who they were are and did a click and found out that somebody was uh, getting to them on, on 17 meters. So I decided to give it a try. So uh, I set it for 17 meters, FT8, uh, looked where, who was talking to who. Uh, I got on for a little bit and did some, uh, uh, FT8, and I was only being heard on the East Coast. Uh, so this is another site I went to to see who was really hearing me, although it turns out France was hearing me. But if you look on the other side, that first column calls that I spotted, uh, I did spot Brazil, Cuba, and Mexico, but nothing real much farther out. And but I was getting out better than I had thought. Uh, so you can also enter a call sign up here and I entered uh, C92RU's call sign and found out that uh, people were working him on 30 meters. Uh, somebody looked like they worked him at 20. This was also a little later in the day when I did this. So uh, 20 meters uh, looks like a, a good shot. But first I wanted to make sure I was pointing my beam in the right direction. Uh, so I entered that into the call sign in the QRZ and went to the details tab. And in this case, they did uh, show where they were from and told me that the roughly 68 degrees was where I should point my beam. Uh, so I did that. And uh, a while later, if you are receiving, they do a CQ, they do put the grid square and WSJT at, so show you what uh, direction to point your beam from, or are being to. Uh, another way I do sometime is I just go to this uh, website, uh, put in the two grid squares, and it also will give me a beam heading uh, of where to point. So the next question is what frequency? So I went back to this DX heat. Uh, and in this case, they showed that uh, down here, 
on Fox Hound, this WB2 Q was working on on 14.095, so that gave me the frequency to go to. So brought up uh, WSJTX, uh, set at 1495, put it in Fox Hound mode, and uh, was seeing people uh, working them. Uh, I had, before I got there, I had to put that 14.95 uh, frequency in there for FT8, so I can easily put it up. If you uh, do a click on a frequency near there, it brings you up some boxes, you can select them all, and what regions to put them all, and to have it for, and the frequency. So to go into Fox Hound, uh, you go into that file settings menu, then the advanced tab, you click the special operating activity and select town mode. And then you're uh, ready to go. Other than uh, in my case, I had to tell, put the step IR antenna to tell what band to go in to get as close as I could to the 14095. Uh, there's some reflections down there, but I got the 14100. Uh, set my green hair and roller to go to 67 degrees, pointed there. Uh, started transmitting and wanted to make sure uh, my transmit level was was fine. Mm -hmm. Want to do it where there's no ridding on the uh, ALC. Also, you can see me down in this box uh, tracing to to get the most wattage out. Is uh, uh, I really wanted that country. Uh, good reading. It's kind of blurred from that previous slide. There's nothing down here in Ella. And your ALC down here, you can see one bar up. Uh, so I just turned that level back a little level, or the that Smith level back just a little bit. So I was doing full power without overloading my my transmitter. Uh, JT alert uh, was showing that there were some call signs calling them. Uh, the next thing was to look for a clear space to start calling. On this Fox Hound mode, the DX station sits down low below a thousand. Uh, people calling them, call them from up above a thousand. And once he hears one of you, uh, the software will automatically move you down so you can respond to them. Uh, as far as uh, shifting, if your uh, left button will just shift your receive frequency, which is shown in, in green. Uh, shift plus left shows you the transmit frequency. So uh, I set new locations. I put it down here where it looks like he was responding first. Uh, this looked pretty clear to me for transmitting. And then started transmitting, went back to this site to see who was getting signal reports. I still wasn't getting down there. I don't remember which time this was, but uh, I gave him a few tries. Is 2141. Uh, and much to my surprise, he came back to me. So at 2142, he's received me with a plus zero seven. So I really didn't need all that 100 watts to get down to him. Uh, the software turned around and gave this minus 17 as a report back to him. Yeah, uh, so I transmitted that. And then he came back with, with this one. I didn't get it. Then he came back with uh, this where the RR73, which said he got my R minus 17 signal report. And that uh, completed the, the QSO. Uh, as you look right here, this is where I was, and this is probably from the web SDR. That's where I was transmitting uh, when he went and told me to go down here and answer him, you can see my little signal down there and that the software changed me down to there. So that this is the software. Uh, this isn't the web SDR. This is, is local. So the top was the web, web SDR at the time. And the bottom one, just to compare it, which I had in that other slide. Um, once the computer, or that, was completed. WSJT puts up this box here, waits for it to hit alt K. When you do it, lots it in its uh, log area. 
you have JT alert up there, it does this other pop-up box real quick. Uh, you don't have to hit it. I missed it for this talk. Uh, I did get the one for the confirming C92 RU. I had to go grab another one for an example. So this would have been the real one I got, and I did it would have had C92 RU, a different frequency in here, and would have had his bridge square. Uh, looking at the calls back to ham spots, you can see that I did report Mozambique a couple times down here. And there was other people who were receiving me. And looked at the C92RU call signs once again. He hasn't spotted because they're probably not online there. So they're probably not spotting, spotting the stuff on their end in all cases, but other people are getting it. Uh, my Utah spot sitting down here and it looks like somebody, I think from Idaho also was spotting them. And then I went back to this page and uh, to see if I could have a nice visual contact with them. Why I got one, I don't know. I would have thought since I set it up to be sent received by anyone uh, in 20 meters within the last hour, it would have shown up. Yeah. Another one back from the history is I was able to work uh, Afghanistan T6AA. Uh, I showed him calling CQ. Uh, I'm calling him up here on 111.106. And he came back down around 501, uh, gave me a report here of minus 18. I gave him a report of minus 14. Then the pro software shifted me down to 502 where I gave him the his signal report, and then he gave me my final report. An example of the JT alert uh, uh, ADA file entry, it had his call time band. There's also the status for logbook of the world being sent and received, EQSL being sent and received. It has his bridge square it puts in there for the distance to it, the current A index, K index, SFI value, what CQ zone he's in, uh, the ITU zone he's in, his prefix, continent, country, and then sort of by default, it is doing my grid square, my zone, and operator, and I use that for uploading to uh, Lodgebook of the World. Uh, live demo. I think I'm going to skip this FT4 demo. And uh, well, let's yeah, we'll skip it and go to the next slide. Uh, here's an SDR console demo that or example that I've captured. Uh, if there's time at the end, maybe I'll show that uh, this sort of is where the beacon is. Um, So example of an FT4 QSO, they go a whole lot quicker. Uh, this is from earlier today. Um, this uh, was calling CQ from Belgium. So I gave him a call, but right after that, somebody from Britain called me. So I had to stop calling him and call the, the British one down here. Uh, he came back to me. And I finished it, and then the Belgian one started calling me, and then I finished with him. So on is just a, a few minutes there. Uh, that's an example of uh, this uh, FD4 uh, mass call signs. You can highlight, put your mouse button on one of those, and it will tell you whether you worked it or give you details of the contact. And there's the passband where I was transmitting, and that's where I was receiving the last time when I captured it. Uh, to go on to future projects, uh, my old EME stuff, I'm, I'm upgrading to better sequencers, and uh, I've sort of keep patching this. I added these two switches to be able to control the Landveer preamps I put up there for 
satellites. Uh, it has a, some sequencers in it and a bunch of relays and it's getting old and they still get too lazy to draw a schematic for it. So I really forget how they work. Also, I do Rover inside van. I used to have a, one of my uh, TS 2000s in here. I was some antennas on the roof, had a laptop here. So I'm slowly upgrading where I'll have one of these embedded computers in here. And uh, so I can work the linear satellites when I'm roving. Uh, another thing to do, I was hoping that if I used uh, an SDR, one of the fun cubes, I could get around the uh, TS-2000 Birdie on uh, the downlink of AL-27 and SL-50. But these boxes didn't have any uh, shielding, so I added some topper shieldings on the inside, outside. That helped a little bit. But the Birdie was still getting up to my antennas and into the SDR. But it did work. Uh, it did calm down on a lot. So if I was transmitting on two meters and receiving on 70 centimeters, the waterfall wasn't as uh, uh, distorted or overloaded. Uh, a lot of the transponders now are coming down on two meters and you're receiving on 70. So you really don't need that extra shielding. Um, on top of my van, I have two little quarter wave antennas I use for the linear satellites. I have some uh, preamps mounted up there. I feed it through the back of the hatch. Uh, I power the preamps from inside the van. So I need to shorten these uh, cables up here so I don't lose as much signal before the preamp, uh, before my next rover trip. Uh, I'm talking about future rows. Uh, well, um, I did work the equivalent Redfish Satellite Award, but now I'm doing it backwards. There's not an award for it, but those are all the grid squares in the United States where I have been in and worked a satellite. The ones that are in red are the ones that I have got a logbook of the world match with. The ones in blue, I just have a QSL with, or I mean the purple, the light blue is I work, but I haven't got a QSL card from. Um, I only, only worked one people in that uh, DM all sits because when the satellite came up, I had a highway patrolman pull behind me and I had to explain what I was doing. So only you got one contact then during that past and he's a silent key and now I've never got it upgraded. The one in FTN24, it's a silent key. So there's no hub for that. The one in EM54, uh, we got it cleared up, but uh, he changed his call sign and got rid of his logbook to the world stuff. So he has the QSL card coming for me. So that will change the dark purple. So my next rove is going to be going through this part of the country. And I want to be able to do both the FM birds, which I do this setup here, and also use that analog one. So that's why I'm interested in getting that SDR going so I can quickly find them. An example of a row spot, this is when I was on the border between Oklahoma and Kansas. Uh, my back bumper here where I'm sitting in the picture was right at uh, 37.0.000. Uh, so there I am working a satellite pass. Um, sometimes, uh, I can't work it from the van, so I have to haul, haul everything over to a sidewalk a little way so I could get a clear shot at the satellite. I just barely got to this rest stop and got out there and everything was tangled. So I was in a mad rush uh, trying to get all my antennas, uh, wires untangled so I could put on my headphones. Normally I have time ahead of time where I can lay it all out. So uh, when the satellite comes up, uh, I can just go put on the headset, start the voice recorder, and uh, start working the satellite. Uh, some of the little foot switch. I found out that these MFJ switch don't like to be pushed on when they're sitting on gravel very much. The rocks get up in them. I don't know if this hile is going to do any better or not. Uh, future, future. Well, I've been told you never can have enough antennas on top of your car. I don't think I'm going to go this far, but uh, uh, <laughs> there's always room for more antennas. So, 
um, maybe I can go back uh, and uh, show another video. So of one of this uh, passes here. So it doesn't seem to want to play. Oh, there it is. So this is fairly short, a, a minute. So I'm looking for the beacon up here. I'm moving mouse. So there's the beacon of the satellite coming down. You can see it slowly drifting in frequency because of the Doppler effect. This pass was just before the meeting, so I was in a very hurry. I didn't have time to get a real good video of it, but uh, we'll go on here and see. I think I find uh, another doc person doing CW in the pass band. Uh, there's my tracking program. Tracking the satellite shows where it is. There's my satellite, rotors moving. Rising. Uh, now there happens the space station's coming up. There's the video showing my antennas moving. Uh, the controller for the preamp. Uh, this computer is controlling the frequency of my radio. If I would have had the headset on, I could have worked somebody on that pass and could have seen myself in the, the, the pass band. So I guess with that, uh, we can take questions. Gary Crum asks, uh, Randy, great tips. What modes have you used the most and in decreasing order and what time of day are you most active? Uh, <laughs> yeah. when the band's open, <laughs> right? Uh, but doing these digital modes, you'll be surprised. Those uh, will say there's nothing happening on the bands, and I go there and actually make contacts with people. Uh, FT8, since I've done it the most, but I've just started doing uh, well, I decided I'd better do w, uh, FT4 for this presentation. So I got on that in one day and worked a whole lot of states and a whole lot of grids. and. Uh, those do go a whole lot quicker. Um, JD65, I'm waiting to transmit about those take a whole long time. I think my longest QSO on there uh, took an hour for one QSO. <laughs> I was not seeing him in the in the waterfall, but I know he had really wanted the Utah. He'd worked me and gave me a whole lot of grids on satellite. So I had in on a whole hour and we did complete the QSO. What band was that? Two meters. Oh, two meters. Okay. He had a single Yagi down there. Oh, okay. Now, uh, now, one question that might come up is, what, in your opinion, what are the better of the RAGCHU modes, digital modes? Because FT8 and FT4 don't lend themselves to much of a QSO or RAGCHU, but I know there's like WSQ call and a few other things and that are come out. What do you... What have you done, if anything, on that? Or are you more of a grab them and get them guy rather than a QSO guy? That's uh, more that. The linear transponders on satellites, you can actually chat sometimes. Uh, but a lot, a lot of times I just have it running and I have multiple monitors on my computer uh, waiting for it to give me an alert for a new grid or a new state or new country. And I'm off doing other things on my computer and uh, just waiting to pounce on people. Okay, um, let's now. Uh, what one question? You know, uh, how how well? I, I'm curious about this personally. When you use one of the web SDRs for it, how well does that work? I mean, if you lose, if you get data hiccups, of course you mess up the timing on some of those. But uh, what on what occasions do you find the using a, like a remote SDR advantageous? or uh, or whatever. I mean, what's your strategy there? Uh, my biggest strategy is when I'm really trying to get that thought sound mode and you sit and transmit, you don't see where you're transmitting. You don't know if somebody else has pounced on top of you. And by looking over that other one, I can see if there's a lot stronger signal shows up because usually I'm where my antennas are pointed 90 degrees from that web SDR but it can show uh, where it is. Also, the other one is just trying to find, if they haven't announced where they are and fought sound, it's a whole lot easier using that web SDR uh, to go look for those signals because it's uh, easily see people calling them without having to point my antenna at them. Uh, 
Let's see, there was another question in there too. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. Well, go uh, ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, usually it worked real well for me, but the other day when I tried it, I don't know why I wasn't getting decoding. Uh, although one hint, if you looked at that first slide, you noticed that I was set up for the North American VHF contest, and that might have had something to do with it. Although oh, I don't, okay. I don't, I don't remember unchecking that later when it started getting it. I suspect it may have been some lag or something on the internet that it was just too far off to have it lock into anything. Because okay. certainly I was seeing the signals there in the waterfall. Right now, speaking of that lag and all that. Uh, these modes all require pretty accurate time on your computer. What have you found to be the best and most reliable way to keep your computer in sync with the actual clock everyone uses? Uh, I think if you look on when you download the JTS or the WSJTS software, I think it's Mannheim or something like that. Right. And that's what I have on there. Uh, when I'm roving, that's not exactly uh, easy because I don't have internet access for that to update. Um, so I, I, I wish there's a way I could hack my uh, GPS receivers to get that timing signal out and uh, keep my PC as aligned with it. I wish um, somebody would hack the German. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm sure there are programs out there that'll do it. One of them that might do it, depending on which receiver you have, might be Lady Heather. I don't know if you've checked that one out. I know that works for some of the uh, Z the uh, GPS DOs, but it strikes me that I think you might be able to use it for uh, just locking your own computer, referencing it to GPS time, perhaps. But uh, that's, I think, by KE5FX. Okay, I'll have to give that a look at. Yeah, it has a bunch of features I've never used. That may be one of them. Okay, anyone else have any other questions on here before we let Randy go? Randy? Yeah. Uh, what operating systems do you use on your computers? Do you use any of the Unix operating systems, or are they just Windows-based? Uh, pretty much just Windows 10 right now. I, I have used the others in the past and might go back to them, but... Okay, I was wondering, is there a particular reason for that, or no, lazy? <laughs> I have to rebuild the software easily. Right. I mean, for casual operation or most operation, you know, Windows is fine. I can't speak to Apple though, um, but uh, I, I think what I've read recently is more. Recent updates of Apple have broken a lot of people's sound cards and people are figuring out how to do that. But Windows isn't, I mean, Apple isn't alone in that. I think Windows 10 upgrades. I saw a flurry of emails too about things switching or uninstalling themselves. They, so, they broke my stuff. <laughs> I've yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't been so lucky yet. But uh, anyway, it, uh, just keeping on, keeping on. Let's see, Dave Sauce says, I'm using NMEA time with a GPS DO. Let's see, you might clarify, is that is NMEA time a program or or uh, or what? Because, you know, I, I'll bet you there's got to be a program out there that will just take the NMEA sentences and set your computer to them. And then you could just use whatever receiver you have that happens to have a serial port of sorts. But, uh, but then, then again... I guess it's not too bad if you have WWV on hand and can are pretty good at can, hitting the button as it beeps and watching the clock and make sure that everything stays with the clicking. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the field, that's about all you can do. Okay. Um, anything else anyone has from our uh, the club? Well, um, if people want to get hold of you for... FT8 or other digital modes, or even uh, acknowledging that you're one of the local satellite gurus, how do people get hold of you? How would you prefer people get hold of you if, for example, people are interested in satellites or anything else you've talked about? Uh, I believe on QRZ uh, for my uh, email as wi7p at emeshack.com. That's okay. still good. All right. Thank you very much. Let's see. Um, let's see. Dave Saw says Sigma is 9.b milliseconds. Um, I'm drawing a blank on what that means, uh, but I guess that's, 
Oh, I could, I could. Do you want me to do a live demo of uh, FT8? Um, it's up to you, but uh, I, uh, I, how's our time? <laughs> um, I, I think we're, I, I think we're starting to get toward the end of it. But I suppose if people want to, want to look around, you know, people. Well, they're online. We don't. We are not keeping it. They can leave <laughs> if they want to. Right. Just maybe. <laughs> just maybe one or two quick uh, QSOs. All right, I'll see if I can raise one real quick. Okay, and uh, he's like, I'll be editing this in post too to make it look more slick than it might appear to be, depending on how things go. This time of day, I guess forty would be your, let's see, forty or eighty would be your choice. Although I saw a lot of signals on thirty uh, just before we started. Uh, well, let's see. What am I on here? I'm on uh, 40. Oh, Let's that's see. a reasonable number of signals there. Let's okay, what explain, what, explain what you're doing as you're doing it. Okay. Uh, I saw uh, somebody, well, let's see. What I want to do is, this is probably a, a better one. He's minus eight, so I go up here, double click on uh, his call. Typically, I will set and give him a report to start with. I go say start transmitting, although I didn't really let's see. I'm sort of in a clear spot. Well, let's move, where's he at? He's down low, so I'm not transmitting. I'm gonna move my transmit down there for the next transmission. And uh, looks like you're transmitting now. Yep. Now, one, one thing that's worth noting is when you double click or click on the person with whom you want to speak, it populates automatically the fields related to that station because once you click on it, it knows who you want to talk to, whom you want to talk, and yeah, fills in that information. Here. This gives us signal reports. <laughs> and it... Uh, and it looks like it's trying again. Uh, yeah, this, so. this is uh, what mo this is FT8, so it's on 15 minute cycles. You go for 15, and everybody else goes for 15, but they're synchronized very closely to the actual UTC minute. Do you mean all right? Second. What? Did 15 seconds. Second? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. You know what I mean. Up to the top of the minute, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to halt. Maybe we can go see what's happening on uh, FT4. Okay. So I go to FT4, it changed its frequency. Yeah, the FT8 and FT4 are on different frequencies. FT4 is even shorter. Its uh, signals are a bit faster. They don't get into the noise quite as well. So I'm going to go start clear. Let's see, erase. Erase all that out so I know what's FT4 and what's FT8. Um, and uh, FT4 has a roughly seven and a half second period. So you can work people without realizing you've worked them. Or some people would say it's the computer that's working them. Yeah. <laughs> and let's see. He's in. So, so yeah, he came back to me. Or this guy came back to me. That's a different one than I'm calling. FN41, according to the my map, that's what the Great Lakes-ish region, I guess. Yeah. It's across the room for me. But uh, just like that. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. I'm still talking. Yeah. What I want to do is give this guy a call. <laughs> Ah, uh, an embarrassment of riches. Yeah, let's see. Where did he go? By the way, David Soss has mentioned that he is using the program any NMEA time from Visual GPS LLC. That's NMEA time from Visual GPS LLC. I knew there had to be at least one of those out there. Yeah, this is a case where I may have made a contact and not realized it. <laughs> oh, no. 
No, you one uh, OPs come back to me now. And he appears to, where is he? Uh, I haven't seen a grid from him yet, but And as I said, this is on my worst antenna. <laughs> right. That that far off the ground. So he how came far? back. So there's a. You're, you're not easily visible. About how far off is it off the ground? Uh, eight feet at the two ends. Oh, okay. Is, in, inverted V. And it's an off center fed dipole. Oh, okay. Like a almost like a Wyndham ish sort of kind of. Yeah with okay. a peak at the top of my house. If you haven't gotten it already, if you are severely limited by antennas where, and you're not much of a CW per portion, first of all, I would encourage you to learn Morse code. I, I don't think you can learn CW because that's what the transmitter does. <laughs> the, 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 you, you, the person operates Morse, not CW. But anyway, uh, but also having said that, some of these digital modes will give you a, door into the ionosphere that might be otherwise unavailable with for those with severely compromised antennas like HOAs or maybe balconies, loops on balconies and that sort of thing. Uh, there's There are many people who have worked uh, DXCC from their balcony antenna using these digital modes. Yeah, I can believe that's easy to do. It's like you went back to somebody else. Oh, well. All right. Well, I'm going to stop. All right. Well, oh. out there. Yeah, it's uh, that gives you a quick live uh, example. Right. It can be very rapid fire. If you're going to start, FT4, FT4 may not be the place to cut your teeth, um, but because uh, it's so rapid fire. But once you've gotten the hang of FT8, which is a much more leisurely sequence every 15 seconds. <laughs> now, I, I, I must admit to not having worked a lot of digital modes since PSK 31. I still see a few people on there, but it's not the uh, usual sit back and chat like it used to be. But there do are people that still use one of those old fashioned modes from the 90s, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think I was asked uh, the least order. The least one I run is probably the meteor scatter one, the MSK 144. Oh, I've yeah. Got lot, I've got lots to learn there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's. I think that's one of the earliest modes too. One of the earlier modes that w align that family, and what what of course Randy's talking about is as uh, meteors enter the atmosphere, they leave a trail of ionization off which you can bounce signals, but they don't last very long. So some of these modes, like MSK one forty four, send a lot of data really quickly over and over and over again on the hope that during the window, which is MSK-144, a one-minute window, is that right? Or is it a... Uh, I don't remember. It's, yeah, it's, it's a minute or two. It's a minute or 30 seconds. And there's some reasonable probability that if you're working for a half an hour, there'll be some brief instance in there just of a few seconds when the signal between you and the other station up to maybe 1,500 miles away on two meters or six will come up. So... That is one of the ways why how you can work all over the place on even two meters. Two meters does open up on certain times of the year to places that you wouldn't think it would because they're just totally not noticed on FM uh, or on repeaters. I've heard sideband on from back in the Midwest several times and somebody like you or Dave uh, Felgar have probably worked stations on the East Coast on double hop two meters before. Uh, on really good days. Anyway, anything else you would like to add, Randy, before we wrap up? No, thanks for the opportunity to show what I'm doing and uh, working on. And if you get on satellite, and I always like people to listen for me when I'm out there rovering. You will enter them into the log book of the world. Okay, and, and for satellite, you need not, not much more than a simple arrow antenna in many cases these days for some of the birds. But he's always appreciated if you drag out your all mode, like, uh, what is it, uh, yeah, FT705, no, no, IC705 or, or, the, or the 817 and point the antenna toward the sky as things come over. 
But uh, sounds like a lot of fun and greatly appreciated when there are people on the birds as they float over. And it's easier a bit in this part of the country since we are relatively unpopulated as opposed to the coasts or some of the other areas. Anyway, Morris, before we head out, let's see, let me wake you up and give you a chance to unmute. Remind people once again about classes that might be coming up or are underway and what they can do about it. Say that again. Um, remind people about the classes you are oh, you, oh, class. doing now or will soon start. Gee, thank you. There you go. Yes. Uh, starting next Monday, uh, the 12th, we'll have a technician class. And on Wednesday, the 14th, we'll start the general class. They both are online or both run for nine weeks. Uh, they both, you need to register that you want to take the class ahead of time. Otherwise, you will not receive the invitation to the Zoom meeting. Uh, and to do that, send me an email at my call sign, ad7sr at arrl.net. And that's it. That will be the last classes until September. And then the way things are going now, we may have an in-person uh, extra class starting next January. Okay, excellent. Sounds good. Uh, everybody stay tuned if you want to upgrade. With that, I think we'll wrap up the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for participating now and uh, on the replay. And be safe. I'll talk to you later. 7-3. Thank you.